So today we are going to talk about uh, what are called Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits. Uh, this is a pretty cool topic because it turns out that even though uh, circuits, and when I say that, really maybe I should clarify what I mean is like a circuit network. Uh, it doesn't even have to technically have a circuit in it, meaning like a closed path. But this, this uh, technique of using Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits essentially is instructive to us because it allows us to see that no matter how complicated a circuit network became, as long as it's linear, we can reduce it essentially to just one source and one resistance. Even if it looks all messy and hairy, as long as it's a linear circuit, it can be reduced to just a single source and a single resistance. And there's two different ways to do that, hence the two different names, Thevenin, uh, that's kind of the technique of taking a voltage source and putting it in series with a resistance in order to make this equivalent circuit. Or the Norton equivalent circuit has uh, a current source that you put in parallel with a resistance, and that's what you use to create a Norton equivalent circuit. So regardless of how kind of complicated a circuit gets, as long as it's linear, we can actually reduce that down to one of these two circuits. Um, and we'll see in just a second here, that actually swapping in back and forth between those two different kinds of circuits is also fairly easy, easy to do. So that's kind of the big picture introduction to what we're doing with Thevenin and Norton circuits. Um, I will mention one other thing before I kind of get started talking about the specifics of what I have in the notes here, and that is that um, what we're doing today uh, isn't so much, in my, at least in my estimation of it, it's not so much useful for being a really good analytical technique to try to figure out what's going on in the circuit. Um, it's really something that allows you to take what looks complicated and make it more simple, all right? And that's, but we're gonna use the, the analysis techniques that I've shown you already, things like equivalent resistance, things like, um, you can even do things like source transformation, you can do things like nodal and mesh, but you can use those techniques in order to come up with what these uh, equivalent Thevenin and Norton circuits are. Okay, so those are kind of some introductory comments. Let's get into this. And, and I guess the first thing I need to say uh, is that we've already talked in here a little bit about what it means to be an electrical equivalent. So two uh, networks that have two terminals, right? So if you look at one network that has two terminals and another network that has two terminals, uh, those two networks are said to be electrically equivalent if uh, they have the same voltage and current relationship, right? In other words, another way to say that is the same VI curve, right? If the two uh, circuits behave exactly the same with respect to, you know, how voltage is related to current, then that means the two circuits are linear. So if you're going to kind of want to state this in terms of a graph, you can maybe show some kind of a graph on here. Let me do that in a little different color. Uh, you can show some kind of a graph on here, maybe something like this, and this would be the relationship for electrical network A, right? So what I'm showing here is like VA as a function um, of IA, right? If electrical network B behaves that exact same way, meaning, you know, if I uh, kind of show what that relationship looks like, let's say it looks something like this and traces just along the exact same curve, Right, and I say this is VB and IB, meaning that's the relationship between voltage and current for electrical network B. If those two curves stay right with each other the whole way, um, then that means that these two circuits are electrically equivalent. Uh, a note that's kind of out in the weeds, one that I'm not gonna have you deal with much, if at all, in this class, is uh, it is possible for two networks to be equivalent to each other within a certain range. Like you can actually specify and say, within the range of voltage from here to here or current from here to here, we can say these two electrical networks are similar and then there can be effects that cause them to diverge outside of that range. So I'm just gonna mention that, even though that's not something we're gonna deal with a whole lot in here. Okay, but this is the definition of electrically equivalent is that they basically have the same voltage current curves uh, with, and I can say extra within some range, okay? Now, here are the Thevenin and Norton uh, theorems, okay? First of all, we're gonna start with the Thevenin theorem right here, okay? 
The Thevenin theorem says any linear two-terminal network consisting of voltage sources, current sources, and impedances, and I'm putting impedance in, in there as the word uh, because we're going to actually expand different ways that we can have resistance, quote unquote, in a circuit, and we're going to use the general term impedance when we get to that point in the course. But I'm going to go ahead and use that term right now, um, and you'll maybe recall back when we talk about this later. For now, you can insert resistance where you see the word impedance, okay? So, um, any linear two-terminal network consisting of voltage sources, current sources, and resistances can be replaced at the terminals with an equivalent two-terminal network consisting of just a single voltage source, which we'll call that voltage of that voltage source V sub TH, the TH stands for Thevenin, in series with a single impedance i.e. resistance for us right now, that right now we're going to call RTH. And that stands kind of for the Thevenin resistance, okay? So what I'm basically saying here is that think of a black box on the left that is some network that is composed of things like resistors and uh, independent voltage sources, independent current sources, dependent voltage sources, dependent current sources, all put together into a network. That linear network when this other linear network, right, that I, they have here on the right, when that one connects up into this one, like this, okay, as far as the network on the right is concerned, you can actually take uh, what is on the left, right, this little block that's on the left, and you can replace it with some other box that instead of being like I'm showing it right here, has just one voltage source in it, right, and the, the value of this voltage source is going to be VTH, okay, with one resistance in series with it, okay, and as far as it looks like to the little network that's here on the right, it will be no different, okay, so that network over there, if that one doesn't change, it will not be able to tell from that network over on the right that what we've done is replace this thing with a different uh, network that in case consists of just one source and one resistance connected up, okay? Um, it will think that is going to behave exactly the same way. It will look as if it behaves exactly the same way from the perspective of the second linear network, okay? Now, I could easily go in and say the same is true from the left toward the right. I could actually replace the linear network on the right with another uh, equivalent circuit that consists of just a voltage source and just a, a um, resistance. Um, and as far as the circuit on the left is concerned, it really doesn't matter as far as the circuit is on the right is concerned. Okay, does this make sense? So you can, you can swap out a very complicated network for one that's very simple, and it will have the same behavior when you do that. Okay, um, this process looks kind of similar for the Norton theorem, right? In the Norton theorem, it says any linear two-terminal network consisting of voltage sources, current sources, and impedances, that is resistances, can be replaced at the terminals with an equivalent two-terminal network consisting of a single current source in parallel now with a single impedance, i.e. resistance, okay? So the way this would look uh, is that on the left, we would replace what's in that black box now with a current source that is actually placed in parallel with a resistance like this. And as far as this network on the right is concerned, it will be no different. Like it, it looks like it's connected to the same thing it was connected to in the first place. Okay, so if it connects up like this and this connects up like this, um, as long as we put the correct values in, which we're going to call in this case I sub NO for the Norton current, and then over here we could call this R sub NO for the Norton resistance. Okay, and as long as I choose the right two values, then as far as the, the network on the right is concerned, it will look like the network on the left is the same as the original one. Okay? Yes. These are practical sources. So his question is, would these be considered pr practical sources? It is not an accident that um, these two different ways of, of kind of expressing a practical source are exactly the forms that we see show up with Thevenin and Norton. It turns out it really is just a way of expressing 
a circuit that behaves linearly, right? So by choosing the correct two values of, of like VTH and RTH, or INO and RNO, you can essentially express linear behavior uh, for your little circuit network. That's another really good question. His question is, so are RTH and RNO, are they equal to each other? I'm gonna scroll this down just a little bit. Yes, they are practical sources. And based on the fact that we can see that these are practical sources and that we've already talked about equivalence between a practical, uh, or what kind of uh, conditions, I should say, make a practical voltage source equivalent to a practical current source, we've already dealt with that in here, right? And that allows us to actually make some relationships for these sources, one of which is that RTH has to be equal to RNO, right? Meaning the resistance that you have for your, equi your Norton equivalent circuit has to be equal to the resistance that you have for your Thevenin equivalent, okay? And because of this relationship right here, it is actually more common when you see in literature and stuff, most of the texts that I've seen drop the notation R sub NO. They just don't worry about calling it R sub NO even if it's going into a Norton equivalent circuit because it's the same as the Thevenin equivalent, right? So whether you're talking about a Norton equivalent or a Thevenin in most of the sources that I've read, it actually replaces R sub NO just all the time with R sub TH so that you don't have to have two different terms for the same thing. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do in my lecture as well, is I'm gonna treat um, R sub NO anywhere that I would have written R sub NO, I'm just gonna write R sub TH just to kind of make it a little bit more simple because the two have to be equal to each other because these are practical voltage sources and the equivalence that we've already talked about for that holds for these two different kinds of equivalent circuits, okay? Um, so that's one of the relationships that we can use, but here's the other relationship that we can use as well, um, and that is that uh, based on, again, on our practical source transformation equation that we had, the Thevenin voltage had better equal to the Norton current multiplied by what? Okay, I'll write it here one more time, one last time as R sub NO, because that might make you cringe a little bit less, right? But um, I could just as easily have written right there, instead of R sub NO, I could just as easily have written R sub TH, because they are equal to each other, okay? So I guess one of the big takeaways so far from this is that if you find a Thevenin equivalent circuit, finding a Norton equivalent circuit is super easy. Why is that? Just basic source transformation, right? So we have this one little equation, VTH is equal to INO times RTH or, R or RNO, right? So that equation allows you to basically swap back and forth between a Norton equivalent circuit or a Thevenin equivalent circuit very readily, okay? All right, questions yet on this stuff? All right, here's another quick thing that I, I felt like talking through right here. Um, when you have two different linear networks, so this kind of gets into what I was talking about up here, that according to what the linear network on the right sees, it's no different to replace it with a Thevenin equivalent on the left, right? So imagine two different linear networks that I'm gonna call linear network A and linear network B. And let's actually, since we now know that we're talking about a linear network when we talk about a uh, practical source of some kind, right? We already looked at sort of what that curve looks like for most practical sources, right? Have we already talked about that in here? I think we did when we talked about practical sources. We basically can, uh, and I'll tell you what, instead of doing it generally, let me actually draw a, um, a specific example, okay? It'll be a fairly simple one. But let's say I've got a uh, practical voltage source right here where the voltage that I have coming in is three volts, okay? And where the resistance I have is one ohm. That's this linear network A, let's say, okay? Now, what about the linear network on the right? Let me make up another one for that. Let me say that on the right, I just swap these and this is three ohms now and this right here is one volt. 
Okay. So let's now say it's not just any linear network A and linear network B. Let's say these are the specific linear networks, or the equivalents at least, of what those networks look like to each other, right? Okay. So now that's what we have, and let's imagine um, if we're only looking at the behavior of the network that's on the left, what would that curve look like on my little VI axes that I put over there? And the way to kind of think about this is that you can um, imagine having like an open circuit voltage and a short circuit current, right? Remember, that's how we looked at this the first time. So what would the open circuit voltage be across the terminals of network A? No current will flow, right, if it's an open circuit. And that means no voltage will drop on the one ohm resistor because no current is flowing. So what voltage will I see at the terminals? Three volts, right? So let me plot that on here and say right here at zero current, because it's, it's an open circuit, I'm going to have three volts. Okay? Now what happens when I short circuit this? In other words, you know, let's say I, I kind of imagine here just connecting up a wire to short circuit this thing. How much current will flow with a short circuit? Okay, three volts divided by one ohm would be three amps, okay? So the way this curve would look like is that I would plot maybe three amps over here, right? This is three volts, this is three amps, okay? And the relationship in between these two will be a straight line. Right? That's how linear network A is going to behave. With me so far? How does linear network B behave? Can I do the same thing? Short circuit, well, start with open circuit voltage. What is open circuit voltage going to be for this one? Okay. One volt, I heard someone say. Okay. And then what is my short circuit current going to be? One third. So this actually winds up being pretty tight right in here. One third of an amp that I'm going to have right there. But that means that this relationship basically behaves something like this. That linear relationship holds for linear network B. Okay. Now, the big point I'm trying to make with this is that if I hook these two networks up with one another, we actually have some relationships that start to have to happen because of Kirchhoff's laws, right? If I hook them up to each other, then the voltage has to be the same across the two uh, terminals, right? Like if I was to go ahead and connect some wires here and say, I'm going to wire that up to that, I'm going to wire that up to that, which looks like this, okay? Now, VA has to equal VB, right? Um, and so, what now happens with these two networks? Well, what happens is, now instead of being any possibility that you could have along like the blue curve right here, right? We've now specified and say it can't be anything anymore. The fact that I've got this other network hooked up, it's going to pick a point along that curve that's going to operate at that point because I've now got this other network connected up, right? Same goes for the network on the right. I've got the network on the left hooked up to it, so it's going to operate at a particular point, okay? Now, here's probably the trickiest thing about it. Um, how much current will flow? Okay, we can actually analyze that little circuit right there. What turns out is that I've got this voltage source in series with this other voltage source leaving how many volts? Okay, it winds up being essentially two volts because these two uh, voltage sources are actually stacked up opposite one another, right? So it ends up being two volts. That pushes through how many ohms? Four ohms. So how much current flows? Half an amp. And in what direction? From where you have the higher voltage toward where you have the lower voltage right here, right? That's the direction that that current is going to flow, okay? So it will pick out a current flow of half an amp, and how much voltage will you have relative to the terminals at the bottom? 
okay? Well, it's going to be 3 volts, right? Because it's going to rise by 3 volts going to here. And then what happens across the 1 ohm resistor? Okay, it's going to drop by 0.5 amps times 1 ohm, which is going to be 0.5 volts. So then what happens? Like what, what voltage am I going to have right here? Rise of 3, a drop of half, 2.5. Okay, this is what happens, and I want to show you how this looks relative to my two curves that I showed up here. Okay, um, the direction I assumed was positive for IA is the direction the current is actually flowing, right? So let me use the left curve, let me use that set of axes to try to put these two curves together, okay? Because that's the direction that's sort of one, right? It's the direction that the current is actually flowing. Over on the right side, I assumed IB was, current, it was flowing to the left, and then it was going to have a curve that looked something like that. If I plot this, now that I say IA is equal to negative IB, right? That those, because I've hooked them up and there's no other place for current to go, IA has to be equal to the negative IB, right? See how this um, arrow points this way, this arrow points this way. That means that those two, since there's no other place for current to go, IA has to be equal to negative IB. So what do I have to do with the curve on the VIB curve over there? What do I have to do when I try to bring that over to the VIA curve or axes? In other words, I'm plotting V now versus IA instead of plotting V versus IB, but I'm saying that VIA has to be equal to negative VIB. Or excuse me, IB, I shouldn't say V. Right, IA has to be equal to negative IB. Okay, now I think I see some of you who are sort of working this out in your mind. What you have to do is essentially negate that curve, and what that consists of is basically negating the horizontal axis. Right, so what you do with that is now instead of plotting it like I showed it, it's the same curve, but now you plot it something like this. Right, because you're, you're trying to plot it relative to IA instead of IB, and we're saying IA has to be equal to negative IB. Okay, so how do you see graphically how these two linear networks will function? What is that point right there? It looks to me like it's at about half an amp and two and a half volts. See that? We figured that out by looking at the specific circuit, right? But we could have kind of looked at it graphically instead. And the bigger point that I'm trying to make with it is that once you hook these two circuits up, there were an infinite number of possibilities when they were apart as far as the voltage and current that they actually could put out. But once you hook them up, they basically hone in on a particular voltage and a particular current right, value that will happen once those two circuits start to interact with one another. Okay, does that kind of make sense? All right, and this is kind of the big power of doing this is this is a little bit of a, I mean, it's a mild proof maybe I'll say, but it's a little bit of a proof as to why Thevenin and Norton work, right, is that you, as long as you've got a linear relationship between voltage and current and you connect these two circuits up, there will, there will kind of be a point where the two circuits will kind of agree on a voltage and current that is going to happen, and then they will be able to function with one another at that voltage and current value. Okay, questions yet? All right, so having put all this up here, let me th summarize how we go about finding a Thevenin or a Norton equivalent, okay? Um, what you do, if you're trying to do a Thevenin equivalent circuit, is what you do is you basically evaluate with it being open, with your circuit that you're analyzing having an open circuit. In other words, you've identified two terminals and you leave them unconnected, okay? With that condition, you evaluate how much voltage is across those two terminals that voltage is your Thevenin voltage, okay? Um, 
and the Thevenin resistance is the resistance seen between the terminals of the same network but with all the independent sources turned off. Sometimes people call that a dead network. In other words, you take all the independent sources that may have been in the network and you treat them as if they've been turned off and then you evaluate what the equivalent resistance is across the terminals. Okay. Um, let's just make a point here and say, when you are talking about it turning an independent source off, okay, um, with voltage sources, that means you treat it as if it's a short circuit, treat it as if it's just a wire, all right? Whereas for a current source, turning it off means you treat it as if it's an open circuit, meaning no place for current to flow, okay? And that makes sense because zero voltage is the same idea as just being a wire hooked up, right? And zero current is the idea of not having any place for current to flow. All right. On the other hand, uh, for the Norton current or Norton equivalent circuit, what you do is you take your circuit network and you short across the terminals. You make a wire connection across your two terminals and you evaluate how much current flows uh, through that wire that you put across the terminals that is your Norton current. And you'll notice here that the description of how to find the Norton resistance is exactly the same as how you find it for the Thevenin resistance. You just look and see what would the equivalent resistance be across the two terminals with all of my sources killed. Okay? So these are kind of the techniques that I will say this is the, the episode one version of how you do this. Okay? And what I'll show you in a little while here is um, that there are some circuits for which this technique might break down. Okay, but this is maybe the easiest one to kind of think about doing first. Shall I do an example? I knew you would be agreeable. Okay, so here's the example that we're going to do. Um, for this little circuit network that I'm putting right here, I'm identifying a uh, node over there on the left as terminal A. So I'm kind of hooking up a terminal right there to that node that's on the left and calling that terminal A. And I'm showing another little terminal on the right side. And I'm calling that terminal B. Okay. And what I want to do is figure out what my Thevenin equivalent is across terminals A, A and B, across the pair of terminals A and B. And what is the Norton equivalent for that? Um, same network across terminals A and B, okay? Um, and a lot of times what I start with when I do these is I try to figure out what is this equivalent resistance, what is that Thevenin resistance across those two terminals, okay? So that's part A, and then we'll use that in parts C, B and C to figure out the Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits for that network, okay? So based on the little description that I have up here, what do I do to find RTH across the terminals of this network? Okay. What's my first step? I got to kill the sources, right? So that's kind of what I'm told to do in this, in this little description of how to do these Thevenin and Norton things. I go in and I find all of my independent sources and I say, treat them as if they've been killed. Okay, so let me go through. I've got two voltage sources and two current sources. Let me start with the voltage sources. Okay, what do I have to do for all my voltage sources? Short it, which basically means instead of treating it like it is a, um, you know, voltage source right there, I treat it as if it's hooked up with a wire. Okay, I do that for both of these. Okay, hooking that one up with a wire as well. Now, what about for my two current sources? Okay, those are open. And one way to do that is to literally just erase it. You can show the little terminals sitting there if you want to. Or you can just erase them all the way. But it basically means there's no path for current to flow anymore where the current sources were. That's what it means to kill a current source. Okay. Now what I need to do is figure out what is my equivalent resistance across terminals AB. Okay. Well, if you actually look at this, those two open circuits that I put in there 
make this uh, pretty nice. How so? Let me ask you this. How much current can flow over here on this leg? None. Why not? The only path it could have had, I've now knocked out because I had a current source right there. That means this whole leg, it's not different if I just erase all that. Okay. How about across right here? Can any current flow right there? No, nope. that means that the same current, because that's, that's the only other possible way current could have gone, the same current that flows through the 80 ohm resistor flows through the 20 ohm resistor. That means those two are in series with one another. That means I can just add the 80 and the 20, right? So that's like 100 ohm of resistance on that leg over there. Is there another leg where current can flow? I've got 60 down here, right? That's the other leg where it can flow. So essentially what I've got here is 100 ohms in, in parallel with 60 ohms, okay? So RTH is going to be equal to 100 ohms times 60 ohms over 100 ohms plus 60 ohms. Okay, some of you probably already have that done. I have that this turns out to be 37 and a half ohms. Okay. So we just finished with part A. We figured out what is the Thevenin uh, equivalent uh, circuit. What is the resistance for that Thevenin equivalent circuit? Which also happens to be the same for the Norton equivalent circuit. Okay, so we're done with part A. Part B, find the Thevenin equivalent for this network. And we've already done half of that, right? We've already got RTH. As long as we can find VTH and RTH, that's all we need to know what the Thevenin equivalent circuit is. So what do you want to do to go about finding the um, VTH, the voltage across the two terminals uh, of these things when it's got an open circuit across AB? meaning I'm not hooking anything up to A and B. Okay. You actually have a few choices maybe in your tool sack, right? Um, I would say that, you know, keep in mind, the sources can't be turned off for this step. The sources have to stay on when you find VTH. And what we're trying to figure out is that voltage from A to B. It looks to me like kind of my go-to in this case is going to probably be mesh analysis. Okay, and so I'm going to take this circuit, copy it, okay, <clears throat> and I am going to set up a mesh analysis down here. What's my first step of a mesh analysis? Okay, you got to identify your meshes, and I think the easiest way to do that is to actually sketch on here kind of what your little mesh loops are and sketch on there what those values are that you're going to be talking about. So I'm going to call that one I1 around that mesh right there. I'm going to call this one right here I2. Okay. And this one right here, I will call that I3. Okay. That's the first step. Next step that you might want to do is try to identify, are there any spots where I can use a technique of a super mesh? Because that makes things a little easier if you can, right? Where do you find super meshes, or where do you expect you might see super meshes? There's usually a circuit component that will lead you to having a, sur a super mesh. A current source is typically what you're going to have that leads to a super mesh, right? How many current sources do I have here? Okay, two of them, and one of them is really nice, right? This one down here, if you'll notice that 0.5 amp current source, how many meshes is it a part of? Single one. And so what does that mean for I1? That means it's not really a variable, right? It's easy for me to identify what that value needs to be for I1 in order to make all this work, because that, that, uh, that current source is only a part of that one mesh. Okay. 
So that kind of, that's the main thing we get out of looking at that, um, you know, at that uh, mesh or at that current source right there. Now what? Do we have any other current sources? Okay, we've got that 0.25 amp current source. And so I would identify here as essentially we've got this nice big super mesh that we can do all the way around there. And when we do it, we do it in terms of the I2 and the I3 that I already have there. Okay, so what does that sum look like doing that mesh? Summing voltages around that super mesh. Okay, minus seven volts, then what? Plus 20 ohms times what? <coughs> I2, okay, I keep on going around until I hit the 80 ohm. And what do I have there? 80 ohm times I3, right? Then what? Then I have 60 ohms. And there I'm going to have I2 minus I1. What's I1? OK. All right, so that is my sum of voltages around that loop. What does it have to sum to? Zero, Kirchhoff's voltage law, okay? So let me actually step back a second. Do I have enough information to solve anything yet? Okay, I know what I1 is, but I already used that in this formula, right? I, I substituted in where I had an I1, so I've already used that. And then in the second equation, I've got an I2 and an I3. So I don't have enough to, to actually work with this yet. I don't have enough to solve for it yet. What else do I need? Okay. Generally, when you have a super mesh, you will also have an equation that popped out of the current source that allowed you to identify the super mesh. Yep. So he said, would it be I2 minus I3 is equal to 0 0.25 amps? Okay. Because we're saying that on this little leg right here, I2 flows the same direction as that current source. I3 flows the opposite. So I2 minus I3 had better be the value of that current source. Okay. Now, with those two equations that I just wrote right there, what's our outcome? Or what's a, what do we have there? That's a two equation, two unknown system. And, you know, generally I'd be happy to show you how to solve that in the calculator, but I have a feeling that if I kept doing that, it would end up being boring for you, okay? So I'm just going to tell you, you can put this system of equations into a calculator, and out of that calculator, you will get that I2 is going to be equal to 0 0.356 amps. Okay. And I3 is going to be equal to 0 0.106 amps. Now, the astute among you would look at that and go, OK, fine, we know the currents, but what were we supposed to find? OK, we're supposed to find the voltage across the terminals, A and B. How does knowing these currents help us find that voltage across terminals AB. Well, let me ask you this. Is there a particular circuit element that also has the same voltage across it? In other words, is there a, is there a circuit element that has voltage AB also across that circuit element? And the way you know that is, does it connect across the two same nodes? Did you, were you going to say? The 60 ohm resistor, right? It has the same voltage across the 60 ohm resistor is the same as the voltage from A to B. So if I can figure out the current through that resistor and multiply it by the resistance value, Ohm's law would say that I could figure out that voltage, right? 
So here's what that would look like, right? We know what, what current flows through the 60 ohm resistor. If we're gonna say a current flowing uh, this way is positive, right? That current is going to be I1 minus I2. Would you agree with that? So that means that VAB is going to be equal to 60 ohms times I1 minus I2, where I1 is 0.5 amps. And I2, we just found as 0 0.356 amps. Okay. And by the way, I encourage you to kind of follow along with your calculator if you want to. Make sure that I'm not lying to you. But um, what I get out of this is that VAB ends up being approximately 8.625 volts. And I will make a, a little remark there that as I worked this, I kept more precision than I'm showing on the page in my calculator as I worked through it. So it might end up being a little different since I didn't keep all the precision on all the intermediate results that I showed you. Okay, so now that I know VAB, what is my Thevenin equivalent circuit? Okay, it looks like this, right? There's going to be a voltage source with 8.625 volts in series with a resistor that is a 37.5 ohm resistor. This would be terminal A and that would be terminal B. And what we've basically said is that all of this mess up here, the three little loops and everything that I had for this original circuit, with respect to anything else that I connect across terminals A and B, that thing I connect across terminals A and B is not going to be able to distinguish the behavior of this circuit up here that we started with from the behavior of this Thevenin equivalent that I came up with down here. It will behave exactly the same. Okay? What do you think about that? You like that? It's actually pretty powerful and pretty handy in, in some instances. Um, it certainly helps to shed some light on the behavior of even complicated circuits. Um, one of the things I think it does even is, let's say you kind of think of it from a designer standpoint, you go, I want a circuit that has all this crazy behavior, right? And so you say, I'm going to get that by having a giant network of all kinds of different you know, voltage sources and resistors and, and uh, maybe even dependent voltage and current sources, that kind of thing. And you go, I'm going to get this complicated behavior based on that network. Uh, basically, the, the Thevenin and Norton theorems say, no, you won't, right? They say, no, you'll end up being able to reduce what you make down to a circuit that looks like this. Okay? That might be both encouraging as well as uh, discouraging, and depends on what, what you're trying to do. Okay. Anyway, um, we good on that? Let me actually do this and go back and remember part C that we were supposed to come up with here, and that is to find the Norton equivalent for this network. There's two ways I can look at this. One of them is, well, I already did Thevenin, right? How do, you know, once you've done Thevenin, what's the easy way to get Norton? Yeah, you say they're both practical sources. I'll just do a practical source transformation, and I'll come up with what my Norton equivalent is. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, right? That way I'll know what I'm shooting toward uh, if I'm in the other scenario, and that is what if I hadn't already found my Thevenin equivalent, right? So anyway, so what do I do if I want to kind of figure out what the equivalent of this Thevenin is. Okay. I'm going to have a current source that points the same direction as the voltage source, right? Going across a resistor, what value of resistor will I have? 
37.5 ohms. This will be terminal A, this will be terminal B. And the only thing that's a little tricky, even, even though it's not that tricky, is coming up with what the value is of this current source. All it's going to be is 8.625 volts over 37.5 ohms. Okay. What do we get there? 0 0.23 amps. So that is basically, if you've already done Thevenin, this is the easy way to get Norton. Okay. But I, like I mentioned, um, maybe you're working this and you're told to just find Norton and you look at it and you go, well, maybe it's just easier to develop Norton from the definition of how to do Norton. So that's what I want to do here is show you how you go about using the principle that we did for the equivalent Norton circuit to do that one directly. Okay. So we'll start at that up here. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll go all the way up here and say, what does it say to do in our little tips? It says the Norton current I sub N O is the short circuit current of the live network. Okay. So what does that look like in terms of analyzing this? I have to do something to this circuit, right? What does it mean to have a short circuit current? Okay. What that means is I'm going to connect up a wire from A to B. Kind of like that. Let me ask you this. If I connect up a wire like that, how much voltage will I have across the 60 ohm resistor? None. I see a lot of heads shaking. Yeah, none. By putting that wire across the 60 ohm resistor, any voltage that I would, you know, if the circuit tried to put a voltage across that, where would the current flow? Only on the wire and none of it on the resistor because the wire is a much easier path to flow on than the resistor, right? So the, by hooking this up, it essentially makes it uh, such that the 60 ohm resistor will have no voltage across it. As a matter of fact, it is going to be equivalent for me to say that instead of thinking of connecting this like this, I can say, get rid of that 60 ohm and pretend like terminals A and B are here. Right? That's actually kind of a not different in terms of how the topology of the circuit is not different. And that means I can look at the current that flows on that little connection right there. That's the short circuit that I'm doing. I can look at the current that's flowing on that connection. And that's, that current is going to be I sub NO. I'm actually going to put that on here. I sub NO flowing from A to B. Okay. Now, what do I need to do for this circuit to figure out that value of I sub NO? What do you say we do kind of the same thing we just did, right? Mesh. I, oop, let me use lowercase, I1, I2, I3. Okay. What is I1 going to be? Is there any difference between what I had last time and this time for I1? No, that's that mesh, right, is still going to be controlled because that 0.5 amp source is only in that mesh. I'm still going to just have 0.5 amps for that I1. So we have that part that doesn't really change. Do I still have a super mesh? I would say, yeah, I still have this super mesh right here that I'm going to do. So that's going to be my next step is to write this equation minus seven volts plus 
what do I have for the 20 ohm resistor? 20 ohms times I2. What do I have for the 80 ohm resistor? 80 ohms times I3. Does that get me all the way around the loop? Okay, contrary to the last one we did, I had a voltage across the 60 ohm. I no longer have that voltage because now I've, I've got that value shorted, right? So that winds up just being set equal to zero. Okay, comfortable with that? What about uh, the second equation? Is there any difference with respect to the uh, the current source that I have there, the 0.25 amp, is there any difference as far as how that equation works? No difference, right? I2 minus I3 is equal to 0 0.25 amps. So now that is the system of two equations and two unknowns that I need to solve to figure out my short circuit current. Okay, what I end up with there is I2 is going to be equal to, uh, I came up here with 0 0.27 amps, and I3 ends up being 0 0.02 amps. Are either one of those my short circuit current? Okay, he wants to know, would it just be the opposite of I2? Careful with that, though, because what you're really doing there by shorting it is there's still a path for current to flow, and we do have these two meshes that are participating on that leg, right? Right on that leg between A and B, we have two meshes that are participating right there. So it would be I1 minus I2. Yep. So that means I from A to B is going to be equal to 0 0.5 amps minus 0 0.27 amps. That winds up being 0 0.23 amps, a value we may have seen before. Right? So based on this, based on knowing that current value, we would construct our Norton equivalent source with a 0.23 amp current source in parallel with our equivalent resistance that we saw for the dead network, that being the 37 and a half ohms between terminals A and B right there, that would be the Norton equivalent based on the analysis we just did. Cool that that turns out to be the same as what we got by first finding Thevenin and then doing a source transformation. All right. Any questions on this? None? You got a question? Yeah, what's your question? His question is, now what do we do about dependent sources? Stay tuned, because that might be what we cover in episode two. <laughs>